Remember Tuesday night? Were you here Tuesday? My tongue swelled up. I couldn't hardly talk. Wow. That was terrible. I actually like want to go on a tangent today, but I'm going to try not to. Is that proper English? What's a tangent? No. Yeah. I think it has some meaning, the tangent parts, like a, make a point or something. I don't know. It's funny to me, the days you think everybody's going to be here is the day nobody comes. <laughs> this is the least amount of people I think that's ever been here. You know, and you think with a new year, a new year resolution, a, you know, something. You know. It seems like every year I have the same one, like what Paul said this morning, you know, just to draw closer to the Lord and have a better relationship with people around me. You know, men, fences that have been broken, you know, things of this nature. And... Um, one year, though, a few years back, I, it's a crazy resolution, but I just decided I wasn't going to chase people anymore. So I used to always be like out in the world trying to get people to come back, and I'd be chasing them. They'd be doing drugs or drinking or cheating on their wives or whatever it is that they're doing, you know? Poor husbands. Don't, don't get all crazy, husbands. But um, <laughs> I found myself spending more time trying to retrieve people that didn't want to come back. Uh, than actually being in ministry anymore, you know? And so that year, I it was um, like 2009, I think it was that year, and I made a New Year's resolution that I wasn't going to chase people anymore. That didn't mean I was giving up on anybody. It just meant that I'm not going to go into the world to try to bring them back. And uh, what I ended up doing is spending more time in prayer for them, more time praying that, that, that God would bring them to the realization of where they were and show them a way back to the flock. Amen. It's like people say, oh, but the Bible says you have to leave the 99 and go after the one, you know? And it's true. You need to always be there for people, especially when they're ready to get right or when they want to get up or when they want to make things right. But you can't convince a drunk when he's drunk to change his life. You can't convince a, a drug addict to give up the drugs uh, when he's in the midst of doing them. It's just not possible. It's usually when they've gotten to a point where uh, yeah, where they want to change, that you're able to come in and reach them, or some tragic thing happens in life, you know. And so it's terrible, but my prayer was that nothing, I, and I always said this, but it always seems to happen. Paul, you dropped a bombshell on me today because of the prayers I've been having. Uh, you know, it's a, you always pray for the person. I always pray that no harm comes to them, but do whatever you have to to bring them back, Lord. But it always seems like they wait till the harm comes. Is the, yeah, I know. Is the harm going to come anyways? You know what? I believe that our life is, is going to be what it is. Uh, what we make it, we can make our life what it is in Christ. It's going to be a better life. But the things we can't control, they're going to happen no matter what. Okay? But the thing is, God has a hand in it when we're in Christ. Amen? It's different. You and I were talking about it on the phone, Paul. It's different. But there's so many people that have walked away from the Lord or, or um, that never knew the Lord, and it seems like they wait till they hit rock bottom before they want to change something in their life. And um, I don't know, the more I pray about it, the more I find that, like Abraham, matter of fact, let me start in prayer and we'll start in, Ab uh, we'll start in Genesis there. Uh, Father, we just want to come to you, Lord, just asking your blessing upon uh, this time together, Father, that this would be a time when you know, I feel like, <clears throat> I don't know if it's because there's so little people here or what, but I feel more intimacy today, like we're being more open with each other, we're being able to share more, or, or we're just um, like a closer bond. Maybe maybe this is uh, the true body of Christ, the ones that, that, um, that are here that love you, Lord, that want to, that truly seek you, Father. I don't know. I just feel you stronger today. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the presence of the people that are here, Father. I ask your blessing in each one of their lives, Lord. And, and Father, as we uh, walk in your favor, we ask that, uh, uh, Lord, you'll use us as instruments to draw others close to you, that they too may walk in your favor. And that's what I ask for this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I was, I was um, just kicking this around a little bit. We're in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. And... Um, 
the first part of the verse here says, we're going we're to start uh, somewhere else, but the first part of the verse here says, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. Amen? We know what it is to fear the Lord. I was um, in Genesis chapter 20. It's funny how just half of verses sometimes just speak to you and change your life. It's like, give you a whole new understanding. It's, it's um, life-changing. It happens to me a lot. Um, let me give you a little bit of the understanding of, of, of the situation, okay? Genesis 20, 11. Um, <clears throat> Abraham was asked to go into a land that didn't belong to him, to a foreign place where he didn't know anybody, didn't speak the language. I mean, he was just, you know, and, and the funny thing is, it was God's promised land to us, to Israel. <laughs> right? And he got to go there before the promise was given. And it was through his faith the promise came. Amen? But he goes into this land and he's actually living in fear because nobody there knows the Lord. He's living in such fear that he told his wife to say that, he, that she was his sister because he thought because there was so much, he had so much fear that he thought they would kill him and take his wife. Which is probably what would have happened. See? So, where he went, sometimes when he went places, people took his sister. Oh, she's beautiful. I'm going to take her. This was one of those cases. And so, what did God do? Because of what happened, God closed all the wombs of the women. Livestock, servants, all of them. He closed all their wombs. So they, they dialed it into Abraham, you know. Why did you do such a thing to us? They said. And here's what Abraham tells them. You guys there? It says, Abraham replied, I said to myself, listen to this, you ready? Abraham replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear for God in this place. There is surely no fear for God in this place. Amen. You know, <coughs> you can go on to read the story. Um, Abraham gets continued, I mean, he gets confronted with it. He tells them the rest of the story, and um, the guy, to try to make amends, brings all kinds of maid servants and man servants and livestock, and gives it to Abraham gold, silver, everything. Tells him, get out of here, you know? And so Abraham prays for them, and God opens all the wombs and puts everything back the way it should have been. Amen? But the part I wanted to tell you is that Abraham said, there is no fear for God in this place. There's no fear for God in this place. I have to tell you this morning, um, I see the world that way. The world around me. I walk into the church sometimes, and I see that. And um, it breaks my heart because we're living in a time where the enemy's winning. We're living in a time where the, the world is, is causing people to fall away. Sin is, sin is more um, prevalent than the presence of God in people's lives. And um, It was happening back in this day as well. It just seems so much stronger today. Look around you, Joan. Amen. I had asked some people this last week, just randomly asked because I wanted to know, <clears throat> why is it that this person's not coming anymore? Because th that was in that person's life. You understand? Why is it that your daughter doesn't come anymore? Why is it that this person doesn't, you know, whatever. Just randomly asked to go with this Bible study. And... People that are solidly, solid Christians, solid in the church, their response to me was sin. They're, it's sin. The Word of God is being preached in our church, and people don't want to hear it, and they leave because of their sin. And that shows you that the world's winning out. We sang songs this morning in Sunday school, Alex. One of them was the same one we sang today. What was it? The Redeemed? I am Redeemed. No, Refiner's Fire. Refiner's fire, and the other one was in the garden. 
And I told them in Sunday school, I said, if your heart is not convicted when you're singing these songs, right? Right? I want to be holy. Right? I want to be holy. Why? Uh, how does it go? Set apart for you, Lord. Amen. I want to be holy. Yeah, that your will. To do your will. Set apart to do your will. You're my master. Amen. I want to be holy. Amen. And as I was singing that song, I saw parts of my life that weren't holy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit convicts us. And so I'm singing that song, and as much as I want to be 100% in the song, I have to first, while I'm singing, ask God to remove those things from my life and empower me to overcome them. And the more I do that, the stronger the song becomes to me. The more I want to be into the song, the more I want to make the song real in my life. Amen? <coughs> Same thing happens every time I read the Word. There's such a great conviction there from the Holy Spirit. That's how your life changes. Amen? That's how you draw closer to God. But when you can sing those songs or you can read your Word and there's no conviction, the world already owns you. The world already owns you. You already belong to a different master. See? You don't want to be holy. And... Um, and I was reading that in Abra I was reading about Abraham and I and I read that just that half a verse and it's it just cut right through me. You know, that there's no uh, no one here in this place that fears the Lord. There's no fear of the Lord in this place. Alex was talking about it this morning. When you were talking, I was thinking, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. It's the same thing. You know, Paul, the things you're struggling with and the commitments you want to make. You know, the things that you're going through and the things that keep happening and the thing that you just told me today, you know, and just on and on and on. These are things that I truly believe would have happened anyways. Do you understand? But I believe that I, and I, and I believe it with my whole heart that they can either define who you are or they can change you if you let them. You know, and that faithfulness, that steadfastness you were talking about this morning, that's where you need to be. And you need to be there even if nobody else follows you. Amen? You need to remain there, brother. Okay? He says in, um, in 11, you guys there in 2.11, 2 Corinthians 2.11. <coughs> I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.11. 2 Corinthians 5.11. Man, I was reading through it thinking, man, this is the life of a Christian. Amen? Remember, he's talking to the church still, too. You've got to kind of see that, but also know that he's, he's, he's showing us the world. Amen? But know he's talking to the church still, okay? So since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. You love it? We know what it is to fear the Lord. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, what we are is plain to God. You see that? Now that we know what it is to fear the Lord, what we are is plain to God. Why? Why does that say that? Because there's a relationship taking place now. Amen? And everything that, everything that, that, um, uh, that causes us to, to uh, uh, be in the Lord or to be in the world is exposed uh, to us through the relationship we're having with the Lord. Amen? And everything's plain to God now that we've chosen to fear Him. Everything about me. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your consciences. Amen? You see that? Here's what was happening while I told you guys to remember they're still talking about, you know, to the church, okay? Understand this. There was people in the church of Corinth that were playing church. They were singing those songs and having zero conviction. They were in God's Word, and having zero conviction. See? Why is that? The Bible says our hearts are going to become hard to things if we're not truly knowing and seeking the Lord. It's going to be as if somebody cut us with a hot iron. Just Think about the sin in your life this morning. I don't care who you are, okay? There's something going on that isn't right. Some of us has something major. Some of us has something that we think is, doesn't mean anything. But let me tell you this, some of you think you're not doing anything wrong because it's who you are and you're going to continue to do it in your stubbornness, okay? 
but you know the whole time it's directly against God, yet you still sit here wanting to worship Him with us. Because you have a hardness and a searing of, of, of like a hot iron in your heart not to receive the Word of God the way it's supposed to be received. God's Word is supposed to be received that we change. God's Word is supposed to be received that those things no longer are part of who we are. We're supposed to receive God's Word to, to empower us to overcome. See, God's Word is life. What we're overcoming is death. But there's people, we'll sit in the church week after week after week with that same sin, knowing that it's wrong, knowing that it directly affects others, knowing that we're... we're, we're See, I have this thought, and I can't say it, but I want to tell you guys that I really believe that each one of us can, can respond to what I'm saying, some of us stronger than others. We need to give those things to Christ, amen? And he's saying now that what we are is plain to God, and I hope it's plain in your conscience, see? We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again. You know what he's telling them? We've already been there. We started that church. You guys know who we are. We're not going to change because now you're listening to another teacher that's telling you lies. We're not going to change because now you're listening to people that are, that are never convicted by the things that they're doing. They're never convicted by the Holy Spirit. There's people like that in the church. I've, I've had people that are teaching in front of the church tell me that God told them that it was okay to be with a woman or a man. In this case, it was a man. She said it was okay for her to be with this man because God said that that's going to be the man for her. Yeah, living in sin with that person because God said it was okay up in front of the church teaching. That's one example that's kind of where we can all see it, right? But there's so many examples of how people will share the, what they think God's Word is saying because they don't hear the conviction when they read it because the Holy Spirit wants to convict their heart. So they're telling you what they want you to hear. They're telling you what they want, want you to know. They're telling you that they want you to respond to. Okay, no. No, no, no. 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 It's not okay. It's never going to be okay. I don't care what it is. I gave you an example you can see, but there's so many others. There's so many more. I was being um, a bad kid when I was younger. And I had tried to go to church, North Orange Christian Church on Lincoln Avenue in, in Orange County. And I was just a little kid. I used to ride my bike. We lived in some condos on Orange Hill. And I used to ride my bike through the alley and around the church and back up, you know. And I started to go to church there. Well, I was being a bad kid. And my mom was starting to feel like, hey, this is a good thing for these kids. They're going to church. Lewis would go with me. And uh, we went for about a month. So, And I really think my mom was going to start coming with us, you know. And um, I used to sit on the steps of the church. I didn't even know, I didn't know the Lord, but I, I would sit there and, and talk to him, you know, about things that are going on in my life. Or, you know, my dad had just left a few years before that, and we were kind of struggling, you know. My mom was raising four of us by herself, and I was acting up in school. and I was acting out, period. I was just a bad kid, period. So what did my mom do? She said, you know what, I'm going to go down and talk to that pastor and see if he can help me with my son, because that's where my son's going, and that's where he's spending his time. She goes down to the church, and the secretary says, oh, he's around back of the youth building over there, that we had like, they had like a, a covering, you know? My mom went around there, he's, he's drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. Yeah, we never got to go to church there again. Never got to go to church there again. My mom never even had a conversation with the man. You know, um, I've had other people that I know have grown up in a Christian home where they just love the Lord and everything's going well with them. And I see pictures of them drinking beer with the pastor of their church. They would have never picked up a beer before. Okay. Do you know why people make things okay like that? And they, they water down the gospel and they don't want to share the full truth with people? Because it'll expose them. And so now their sin becomes the sin of the church. You think I'm wrong? We're going to read it. We're going to read it right here. Watch what it says. 
Are we, 12, okay? Are we trying to commend ourselves to you again? But are we giving you, no, but are we giving you, I said that wrong, I don't even know. Let me, but are we giving you an opportunity to take pride in us? Here's what he's saying. Remember who we were. Remember who you were when we were there and how you were growing in the Lord. Look what he says. So that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in their heart. See that? He's talking about those that are, that are doing things for material reasons, those that are in sin still teaching the gospel and things like that. He's saying, I, I want you to take pride in us because we shared Christ with you. I want you to take pride in us because we raised you in Christ. I want you to take pride in us because now you're saved and you know the Savior. Amen? And I want you to do that. I want you to take pride in that so that you can give an account to those who are trying to lead you astray. And he's talking about in the church. You get it? I, I'm going to tell you something, and I really mean it. And I've always meant this in the church. And I've always tried to live my life according to it, Okay? I want nothing from you. I want everything for you. I want nothing from you. I want everything for you. You understand? And that's how you can judge somebody in the church. That's how you can judge for yourself who to follow. Amen? And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm not asking you to follow me. I'm asking you to stand with me and follow Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm asking you to stand in His Word with me. I'm asking you to open your Bible every time we get together and go word for word with me. Amen? Let's not leave anything out lest we might make a mistake. Amen? And most importantly, I'm asking you this morning, I'm asking you this morning, let the Holy Spirit convict your heart. Whether it be in a message like this, whether it be in a Sunday school class, a Bible study, or better yet, every day when you open your word. Let the Holy Spirit convict your heart. I'm telling you, um, Beverly, I just want to talk to you for a minute, okay? I don't usually talk to you that much, but I want to talk to you. I have the worst conversations during the week sometimes when I'm down here. There are conversations I don't want any part in. You know, people are telling me how righteous they are. They're telling me how strong their faith is. And, and, and the whole time, the conversation started off with what they're doing and how wrong it is. You see? But they, because of the world and because of the kind of teachings that we're talking about, they think that they're okay and have done nothing wrong. And if they think they've done something wrong, they think they're still okay. And they're continuing to do it. They're continuing to live in it. You're going to continue to live in your sin and do the things you've always done that have brought you nothing but harm until the day you submit it to Christ. Submit it to Christ. Don't tell me you have faith. Become. Live that faith. Trust Him with everything. Amen? See, there's a lot of false teachers out there. The Bible tells us that in the end times they're going to be worse. There's going to be way more false teachers. If you can't take it to the Word of God, then, then it ain't there. It ain't real. And listen to me, okay? Listen to the title. It says, Ministers of Reconciliation. Amen? Christ gave His life to reconcile us to God. You hear me? God's Word and who we become in Christ, shared with the world, reconciles them to God. And you and I are now ministers of reconciliation, and the only truth... The only true reconciliation that you can help anybody have is if it comes through the truth of God's Word. It has to be in Christ Jesus. It has to be. Amen? Did you know that we're going to read it here too, just like I told you we're going to read that part. We're going to read this part, okay? It's God's will that every one of us be reconciled to Christ and then become ambassadors of reconciliation for Him. Did you know that? If you don't know Jesus, Alex, how are you going to reconcile anybody to Him? What are you going to reconcile Him to? That it's okay to get away with something? You see it? Watch. Let's just read it, because this is too much. I, and i got to tell you guys something. <laughs> I had something way better planned. 
13. If we are out of our minds, I love this. Listen to this. Here's what he's saying. If you're hearing me, right? Watch this way. Let's read it first. If we are out of our minds, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So you know what? If you're still going to stay in your sin, you're still going to perish, you're still going to follow those false teachings, then I'm out of my mind for the Lord. Amen? But if you guys are listening, and you want to hear the Word of God, and you want the Word of God to change your life, then this is for you. Amen? You get it? You know, I used to think, uh, uh, Paul, uh, I used to get like discour discouraged, like, like not want to talk, not want to share things with people, not want to get intimate with them because I know how they're going to treat me or what they're going to say or what they're going to think. I don't care about that anymore. I don't care about it. How are you going to know who's, who's, who's been set aside? How are you going to know how to separate them? Amen? You need to tell the truth to everyone. You need to share that truth. You need to live it. And you know what? If people think you're crazy, you're crazy. Amen? But if the ones that will listen their life is going to change and they're going to have eternal life. Amen? True story. I think I shared it once before with you, Sandy, okay? But my mom used to tell me that I was crazy and all this stuff was in my own head. Because I used to preach to her just like this, just one-on-one. -on -one. She told me I was crazy. That stuff's in your own head. You're crazy, she said. Right? Then one day she came to know Jesus. And do you know she's crazier than I am now? Amen? Amen? Right? Before that, I was out of my mind. Right? Now you get to be out of your mind with me. What do you think about that? But we would have never known had I not preached the gospel to her. Over and over and over again, we'd have never known. She would have never known. Amen? You ready? 14? For Christ's love compels us. That's the most beautiful part of the whole message right there. You know, the closer I draw to Jesus, the more He compels me to share the truth. First, He compels my life to become the truth. Then He compels me to share it. Amen? I can't help myself, Joan. It just happens. <laughs> because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Amen? You know, before I go any further with this, I want to share that with you a little bit, okay? I've heard a lot of sermons. I've heard a lot of sermons from... from prominent people that I look up to. I mean, just amazing people who know how to share the gospel. Amen. And they've, they've said, you know, there's, there's a chosen people that God died for. Okay. And then they're going to they use this scripture to say to tell you that. Okay. I want to share something with you. Can I? Okay. I believe they're right. Not in the way they preach it, but I believe they're right. Okay. I believe God, Jesus, died once for all men, that not one would perish, but that all would have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen? But, and I believe when he says he chose, he chose all of us. But it doesn't mean all of us are going to come. And some pastors will preach that there's only those certain, they preach it the same way, but backwards. I don't know why. They try to make it like there's some that just are never going to get there. You can't think like that. Because if you think like that, you're never going to try to, to, to share with the others. You're never going to try to reach them. Listen to me, Alex. I believe this since I was a young Christian man, okay? If Christ Jesus died for all men's sin, that not one would perish, there has to be a way to reach them. That's the minister of reconciliation. That's where it comes into play. There has to be a way to reach them. I'm not saying that everybody's going to get saved, but I'm telling you there has to be a way to reach them. We know not everybody's going to get saved. You know how, can I tell you how I know? Huh? I, <laughs> I smell the blood of your brother in the ground. See? Cain wasn't willing to submit to Christ. And do you know that he could have still submitted to God after he killed his brother and been forgiven, but instead he went and lived in the wilderness you were talking about? Did you know that? Did you know that, that, that um, Judas Iscariot didn't have to hang himself? He could have asked Jesus for forgiveness, and Christ would have forgave him, just like he did all of us who put him on that cross. He didn't have to die and go to hell. And the Bible says in the first chapter of Acts that he fell headlong, his body burst, and he went where he belonged. He didn't have to do that. 
There could have been a way to reach him. Christ died for him. And isn't it amazing? He got remorse after Christ died, so he knew that he was wrong. He knew who Christ was, and he still went and hung himself. Okay, I said that for a reason. I'm sorry. Why do we still do the things we're doing when we know the truth? Yeah, there's no fear in this place. There's no fear of the Lord in this place. You know what? I want fear of the Lord in this place. Amen? And I still find myself doing something I shouldn't be doing, and I should have been fearing Him and not getting involved. Right? We need to end that. And that ends through a relationship with the Lord. Amen? I, I, I pounded and I pounded and I pounded. That's probably why nobody's sitting here. I don't know. But we need to know Jesus. And we need to know who we are in Christ. Amen? I, I keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, not because it's something you really need to hear, which you do, but it's because it's in God's Word over and over and over again. Peter said it like this, I have no problem telling you over and over and over again, because once this tent, this body is gone, amen, you'll remember what I told you. Amen? I don't know where we're at. Let's go. 14, 15? 15. Let me read 14 again so what I tried to tell you makes sense, okay? For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. I'm sorry, I have to stop there again. I didn't get to finish sharing that with you. <laughs> okay? When Christ died on the cross, um, Paul, everyone died. Everyone died. You know, let me tell you something, okay? When Christ died on the cross... Okay? He died for all men's sins. Until man submitted those sins to him and asked forgiveness for them and asked Jesus into their life, they were all perishing. One man died for all, and all died. Because why? You have to compare yourself to Christ. To think, if you think for a moment that you're okay, compare yourself to Christ and you'll see you're not. The beauty about comparing yourself to Christ is He opens your heart to see who He really is. Amen? And He gives you a way out. Because He covered your sin with His blood. So all died the day Christ died. Because we are judged by Him. Do you understand? We're judged by Him. Unless we're cleansed by Him, then all judgment goes away. Are you ready? For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Amen? So he says, for those who live, he's talking about those who receive him. Now we know, he says it right here, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. Now that we know, amen, what ought we to do is what he's saying. See that? And he says up here in 16, he says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no longer. Amen? You know what he's saying right there? You know what Paul's saying right there? He's saying, I used to see Jesus in a worldly way. I seen him through worldly eyes. I was living in the world. And I saw Christ that way. I saw him, I saw him as being worldly. Can you imagine the thoughts he had for Jesus before he knew who Jesus was? He wanted him dead. He wanted him silenced. He was coming against everything. That was all worldly. All of it. You understand? The stoning of Stephen, all worldly. These people did nothing, but the world wanted them to shut up because everything they said and did exposed the truth to them. And I saw them as worldly at one time. I saw Christ that way one time. I used to see Christ that way before I knew Him. I used to justify everything I did, even though I knew He was real, through the world's eyes. And I used to see Him that way too. People have written movies about Him that way. That He hooked up with Mary Magdalene and got married and stuff. Get real. Had kids. What? They saw Him in a worldly way. Yeah. What's that one, Jesus, the star one or whatever, where they're singing about all this dope and everything? Come on. People saw him, people saw him in a worldly way. Right? Now, let me. I want to share this with you. The reconciliation part comes in like this, okay? I've been reconciled to Christ, right? 
through His blood on the cross because He died for me. And my love that I have now in my heart that Jesus had for me compels me. Amen? To what? To share Him right. First, it compels me to be in a righteous relationship with Him. Paul, you've met men who just sleep around with all kinds of women and they're married. And they don't even care. Their wives even know. Iron me some clothes right now, woman, because I'm going out tonight. Oh, I've known men like that. Beat their wives down when they get home because they're wondering where they've been and where they've been out all night. Who are you with? And they just go from woman to woman to woman to woman and they're spending all this time in the world doing all these things without a care in the world. Right? Do you know that when we live in sin like that, we're doing that to Jesus? He called us an adulterous generation. See, you get it? But when I understand what, who He is and what He did for me, and who I am now because of Him, and His love for me compels me. So I may see those things in people, but I don't want to see them from a worldly point of view anymore. I used to see Christ that way, but now I'm in Christ. I told you guys a hundred times before in the church probably. What did I tell you? Stop seeing people the way the world sees them and see what they could be. And that's what he's saying here. If you can't get past your prejudice of people, when you're, and you know what Paul says? When you're doing the same kind of things. Remove the speck, Matthew says. Amen? <coughs> when you can't get past yourself to share the gospel with somebody, who's the one in sin? See, you've been redeemed by the blood of your Savior who died on a cross without sin became your sin. Amen? He's saying, if you're going to help me now, because I live in you, redeem people to my Father the way I redeemed you on the cross, you need to stop seeing people like the world does. I used to see Christ that way. Now he's asking me to stop seeing people that way. You got, I, I'm not getting it through to you guys, really, because I want to share with you something greater than that, okay? See, it's the world in us that sees those things. And he wants us to stop using those eyes to see that. But to use the eyes of him who redeemed us to see what he created it to be. You get it? We only act that way, see that way, talk that way, and, and respond that way, and withhold ourselves from those people and stuff, that prejudice we have, because all of that's worldly. And he wants us to stop seeing people that way. Amen? And listen, the false teachers in the church see people that way. And you have to be like them, Alex. Amen? you got to stop. You ready? Watch what it says. 18? 16? 17? No longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... See that? Don't you love it? How come I never heard that before I became a pastor, actually, before I started in, in teaching? I never heard being in Christ over and over and over again in the Bible, but it says it. We have to be in Christ. You know what it's saying? We just told you, uh, Sandy, to stop seeing through the world's eyes because the world's in us and that's the way we see things, right? So now we, we need to be in Christ. We need to see things through Christ. Amen? In Christ is reality. We need to see things in reality. Right? Being in the world, that's the shadow of darkness. That's death. So we're looking through the eyes of what? Yeah, darkness. Right? Right? Therefore, am I in 17? Therefore, if anyone is in, therefore, if anyone, if anyone, if anyone, if you today are in Christ, he is a new creature. Everything we talked about comes out in these two verses. I and mean, this is my favorite verse in the Bible. Some, well, I have a million of them, but this is one that I really, as a young Christian man, spoke to me. He says, He is a new creature, and the old has gone, and the new has come. Amen? See, we no longer see things, people, situations, or anything in the world. You know, there's just a few of us here today, right? So I'm going to talk to Paul for a minute, okay? Paul, what would your life be if you were seeing everything you're going through in the world? It'd be a mess, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? It'd be a mess. Paul, I could not be sustained right now. 
if it wasn't for Christ. Amen? I would have already lost it. I'd already been somewhere else doing something else. I would have already been, I don't know. Do you know how many people in the cancer center, Paul, that me and my wife see every day, every two, three times a week, that are there by themselves because their spouses have left them because they didn't sign up for this? You know how many parents are there with one parent with the child, not because the other one's working, but because they left them over it? True story. It's sickening. It's sickening. When you're praying with a woman who, who, who's only got three months left to live at Tops, and she's lost her husband, and her kids don't come around, I mean, just it's sad. You know? Story after story after story, it's just sad. I've gotten to her, honestly, I'm a pastor, I quit talking to people. I don't, I just, it's too much. When I go to the cancer center, I go there to deal with what I'm there to deal with, and before I would be off talking, praying. I couldn't go into a hospital without five people pulling me different directions because they knew what I was there for. I, I'm not that person anymore. The last time it happened was with you, Paul. The lady, remember, and her family? And, um, I want to be that person, but you know, you just, you get overwhelmed, and it's just amazing the stories, the, the world, the worldliness in the lives of people, just saddens me, saddens me. Do I want to be going through what I'm going through? No, but I sure wouldn't want to go through it without Kathy, I sure wouldn't want to go through it without your Kathy, you know what I mean? I sure wouldn't want to go through it without other people, my church family, or you know? It's just sad. I can go on and on and on about that, to be honest with you, but we're supposed to be living a new life, amen? The old life, that life where we used to see through the eyes of the world, is gone. We're living in a new life now, amen? We're living in Christ Jesus. We need to see things the way Jesus would see them. And you know what happens when you choose that, Paul? You start to feel things the way Jesus felt them. Everything changes, Amen? All of this, all this is from God. Wait, I got to back up. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God. Amen. Who what? Reconciles, reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. You know what he's calling you to be? Jesus Juniors. I want you to be a Jesus Junior. Amen. I was telling him in Sunday school, Alex, that um, you're responsible for every life you touch. See, I've been saying that for years about being your neighbor, who's your neighbor, everyone you come in contact with. You're responsible for every life you touch. Listen to me. You're not responsible for, for the choice they make. You're responsible to share that they have a choice. Every life you touch. There's so many of us that just sit by and do nothing. And our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our aunts, our uncles, our parents are perishing and going to hell. And we sit with them every day. And we say nothing to them. They're following false teachings. They're, they're, they're following the world. They're caught up in things. My uncle Bobby, I had an uncle that died. And his children were young. And my uncle Bobby did nothing. He got cancer and he was dying. And even during the cancer, he spent a year doing nothing, two years doing nothing. He had about six months left, and he called the whole family together, and he tried to fix everything in that that one moment, in that one moment of time, asking, begging them for forgiveness that he wasn't there for them, and that's why they got on drugs, that's why they did the things they did. I sat right there with him, thinking, wow, this is amazing, but you know what God was sharing with me? We need to be that now before we get sick. We need to be that now before something happens. Amen? It's like I told you, you know, you, 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 you coddle Jacob now, and he's the oldest. You coddle him like he's a baby. You want to lay in bed with him and hold him, and you want to love him, and you don't know how long you have with him, and you just want to spend every moment treating him right and feeling good about it, right? You ought to treat all your children that way. You ought to treat all the children in the church that way. And it ought to be who you are, not because something happened. Amen? You get it? Right? Okay. I want to go way out there on a tangent, like I said. I'm going to stop. You ready? 
Reconciliation, that's what reconciliation is. Knowing Jesus, right? Surrendering your entire life to Him and then spending that life with others. Amen? Uh, that God has reconciled the world to Himself in Christ, in Christ, not in, in, in Christ, not continuing, not counting men's sins against them, and that's that's our reconciliation too. How we're going to help people be reconciled is by not counting their sins against them. Amen. Okay, and He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That right there, I told you, was God's will for our life. He's committed to us the the message of reconciliation. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian today who loves the Lord and spends time with Him, that's what the Lord's telling you. The Lord's telling you to give what I gave you. You know, we were singing a song on Tuesday night. We were singing a grace, truth, this, that. And it cracked me up as I'm singing the song. I'm thinking, Jesus, 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 Jesus is grace. Jesus is justice. Jesus is truth. I'm just thinking, Jesus, Jesus, you know? You know what? You know that God gave you grace for the things you've done, right? What's reconciliation? It's when you give others grace. The same grace that was given you. Amen? You get it? When you live in God's truth, the same way God's truth gave you life. You get it? It's crazy, right? We are there for Christ's ambassadors. You see that? We're there for Christ's ambassadors. What's an ambassador? Yeah. Amen? Where's ambassadors? Right? They need to see Christ when they see us. Amen? Yep. As though God were making His appeal through us. Isn't that what's happening? He's telling us that the way Christ reconciled us on the cross, we need to lead people to the cross to be reconciled to Christ. Get it? It's beautiful, huh? We need to get past ourselves to do it. We need to get past our prejudice, everything that worldly in us that sees people the way we shouldn't see them. Listen, they're doing it. I'm not telling you they're not. They're sinners. And they've fallen short of the great glory of God. Amen? Okay? I'm not saying they're not doing it. I'm just saying if that's all we're looking at, we're never going to share with them. You get it? Are you ready? We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though, as uh, through God, wait a minute, as, th- as through God we're making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen? Remember I told you guys that if Christ died once for all, there has to be a way to reach them? That's what He's imploring us to do, to reach them, because He did do that. Did you catch that scripture? That's what He's imploring us to do. It says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul's finding a way to reach them. Amen? And that's what he's calling us to do. Listen, he's imploring them, right? Right? To come back to God, right? But you know what he's telling them? When you get back here, you've got to stand with me and do this for others. Amen? Get it? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. You know what I can't stand about some some people? They say, I'm the righteousness of God. But we just read it's only through and in him that we become the righteousness of God. See what he's saying? It's true. We become the righteousness of God the minute we get saved. Okay, Joan? But we don't become personally become the righteousness of God until we start to be like Him. And it happens in and through Him. Amen? As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Remember I always talk about receiving God's grace in vain? Right? People abuse God. They try to abuse Him. They do all this stuff they want to do without caring, with a calloused heart, because they've been saved by grace. He says not to receive His grace in vain. 
They're all ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Amen, right? And you know, that's what you first tell them. You, here's what you tell them, okay? They come and they confess something to you, and you're like, you're trying to work with them in the Lord, and you're like, well, you're a work in progress. It's going to get better. Just keep seeking the Lord, right? And then every time after that, for the next 20 years, you, you say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> that's receiving God's grace in vain. You understand? I'm going to do the same sin for the next 20 years because I'm a work in progress. Amen. Yeah, the day I go see Jesus, I'll graduate. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. He's saying today's the day. Today's the day. Amen. If you're, if you're, here's what he's saying about his favor right there. If you're experiencing the Holy Spirit today about something in your life that isn't right, just like the day you got saved and salvation came to you, today's the day to give that to me. Today's the day to overcome it. Because today's the day of my favor. Don't leave here today without God's favor. Amen? We need to get a breathe right for David. David. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end this with this last couple sentences. Are you there? It says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. Amen. <laughs> um. <laughs> I want to share something with you guys just real fast, if I can, about God's favor. I shared a little bit in Sunday school, but remember I told you your neighbors, everyone you come in contact with, and that you're responsible for those people, okay? When you choose to live and walk in Christ, okay? When you choose to be in Christ and you choose to walk in Him by taking it out into the world. You know one of the songs we sang in Sunday school, Alex, was in the garden? And part of the song says, I love the song because it reminds me of my quiet times. It's personal and intimate with him, amen? And I don't want to leave sometimes, but he bids me go. You know that part of the song? He bids me go. Do you know why he's bidding you go? Because he just shared something with you that was life-changing. He wants you to share with the world. So when we go in Christ, we take what Christ is doing in us into that place. Amen? And let me tell you guys something. The more you seek God, the Bible says, if you seek me, you shall find me. Amen? If you seek me with your whole heart, and even put me before these things, they'll just be added on to you. Amen? Right? Well, when you seek God with your whole heart like that, then God's favor is in your life. And your life, every life it touches, God's favor touches. And that's how lives are changed. Amen? So let's live in God's favor. Amen. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what is happening around us. Amen? Father, we just want to come to you, Lord, just asking, um, Lord, for your blessing in each one of our lives that, um, Lord, that we would learn to put you first. It's so sad because there's so many things each of us put first, Lord, and uh, when we look at ourselves and uh, through your eyes, Lord, we see the world. When we look at ourselves through the world eyes, we see everything okay. Lord, just give us your eyes. Like that song we sang when opening this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see Jesus.